Detective Zach Scott. I'm with the Broward Sheriff's Office Homicide Unit, and I'm one of the lead investigators on this case. Um, we're going to go through the events that occurred in the 1200 building utilizing a computer animated um, visual as far as uh, movement of the suspect. Um, there's going to be some information that obviously we're unable to share at this point due to the fact that we do have an ongoing criminal investigation. There's going to be some information that we're not going to be able to share because we also don't want to inspire others. Unfortunately, we do know in these cases a lot of times they do research previous events. Um, but I do think this will at least give you an idea of what occurred. Um, on February 14th, our suspect approached the 1200 building from the east side, which is uh, the direction of Pine Island uh, Road. Um, this is your schematic for the first floor of the 1200 building. East would be to my right. Uh, if we could pause here for a second. Just to give you an idea, um, as far as the color coding in this visual, the green dots represent students, blue dots will represent teachers. Um, as, as, as people who were part of this incident um, are injured, the dots will change to yellow. Fatal fatalities will be a purple color. Uh, the suspect in this case will be a black dot with a line through it. Okay, if we could pause here. As you can see, we have uh, three students that enter through the east side door, followed by the suspect. Uh, we also have other students that are in the hallway as well. Uh, this is at that time you see at the bottom is the uh, time code based on the information we have from inside the 1200 building. The shooter enters the stairwell immediately to the right. He's carrying a, uh, a rifle case at that point. A witness enters the stairwell, if we could pause here, uh, as the suspect is taking the weapon out and preparing it. He makes a statement to the witness who immediately flees and seeks help. Okay? And if we could pause here. The suspect enters the hallway, he begins moving west, and he immediately opens fire. As you can see, we have several victims there on the south side in front of the doorway to 1215. They immediately come under fire and uh, are injured, and these injuries eventually become fatal. Uh, further west, you see another victim. Uh, she, uh, excuse me, that victim is also injured and takes shelter, uh, but is able to uh, get to a position of cover and survives injuries. At this point, uh, if we could pause here, uh, the suspect goes to classroom 1216 and fires from outside of the classroom into the classroom. He strikes four students inside this room, one of which is instantly fatal. Three other victims are injured at this point uh, inside that classroom. Now, at this point, during the first series of gunshots, that triggers the fire alarm system on campus, uh, not just in the 1200 building, but also elsewhere. Now, also during this video, there are times where the, the uh, information is somewhat obscured, and we don't know necessarily exact movement, so when you're watching the visual, you may see that the uh, suspect dot stays stationary. Um, at this point, after firing into that classroom, he does uh, pause momentarily, appears to be taking things out of a backpack uh, that he does not take with him uh, before continuing. And again, there's going to be times where the time code is accurate. It's just that visually we are, are unable to determine his exact path. 
Continuing west, as he passes the previously injured victims, he does fire additional rounds. He then begins to fire into classroom 1214, again from the outside in, if we could pause there. Uh, we have two victims that are struck fatally in this room and four additional victims who are injured. The suspect then, we can continue, uh, continues back to the north side of the hallway and then returns back to the door of room 1216 where he fires additional rounds into that classroom. We have two more victims who are struck fatally and another victim who is injured. If we could pause here. Now on the far, my left, which is the west side of the hallway, you'll see that another victim has entered the 1200 building. Uh, the suspect uh, immediately sights in on this victim and fires several rounds, striking the victim uh, who is injured. That victim then is able to take cover. Okay, we can continue. And if we could pause here. The suspect at that point goes to the outside of classroom 1213 and again fires into the classroom from the outside. Um, we have one victim who was struck fatally and several others who were injured. Can you continue? Suspect continues west as he passes the previously injured victim. He fires additional rounds and those wounds are fatal. If we could pause here. As the suspect enters the stairwell to proceed up to the second floor, another victim, as you can see from the graphic, is entering on that west side stairwell door. Uh, as the suspect enters the stairwell, the victim is opening that door and is immediately shot fatally by the suspect. And continue. Now the suspect proceeds to the second floor. Um, there are no one, no victims in this hallway. If we could pause here. Uh, as the suspect continues in a eastward direction down this hallway, he does fire into two classrooms on the second floor. However, no victims are struck by gunfire. Uh, he fires several rounds through into a uh, north side classroom 1231. These rounds actually travel through the classroom and out the exterior windows. Uh, he's then going to move on to room 1234 where he fires several more rounds uh, that also travel through and out the exterior windows. And you can continue. The suspect then continues to the east side stairwell where he's going to advance to the third floor. And if we could pause here. Uh, on the third floor, we, we have a response to the earlier fire alarm that is still going off at this point. So you do have several victims and witnesses that are uh, outside of classrooms. As the suspect comes onto the third floor, um, there is a victim in front of the door of 1256. He immediately shoots that victim and begins to shoot westward down the hallway at the other victims and witnesses who are in the hallway. We continue. And pause here. Um, as you can see in 1255, we do have another uh, witness who was struck uh, by fragments and does survive their injuries. Uh, further down the hallway, you can see three, uh, actually a total of four uh, yellow dots. These are all victims who were initially injured by the gunfire. 
Continue. And pause here. Uh, at this point, the suspect turns his back to the rest of the hallway. We believe at that point to reload his weapon. When he does so, several of the uh, students and faculty that are trapped in that hallway are going to try to run for the stairwell on the west end. Continue. And pause here. Uh, as that group of students and faculty make their run for that stairwell, uh, the suspect does realize that he's got more victims moving in the hallway and opens fire. Uh, we have two victims that are struck with fatal injuries and another who is injured. Continue. And pause here. As the suspect continues west down the hallway, as he passes victims he is earlier injured, he fires additional rounds at these victims, injuring them fatally. Um, he passes one victim who's in the middle of the hallway there who does survive his injuries. Continue, please. And if we could pause here. Now, room 1240 is a teacher's lounge on the third floor. It's on the west corner of this building. Um, this is an unoccupied teacher's lounge. Uh, at this point, the suspect shoots the uh, glass um, to this door to gain access and enters this teacher's lounge. Um, the lounge has windows that run its entire west and south side. It gives a clear visual of the rest of the Stoneman Douglas campus in those directions. Understanding that the rest of the campus is responding to a fire alarm, most of the students are out of their classrooms and outside the school. Continue, please. From inside this lounge area, uh, the suspect, over a period of it's approximately two and a half to three minutes, and again, we have some visual issues here, so we don't know the sequence exactly. But at some point, he fires five rounds in a west direction from inside the 1200 building out towards the students that are outside. He does the same thing in a south direction, again, towards the students who have evacuated the buildings in response to the fire drill. Due to the construction of those windows, as far as the materials that they're made out of, exterior windows of the building, the rounds fragment and splinter immediately, and they do not find targets. Now, during the same time period, the suspect uh, conducts at least a reload. Suspect then leaves the teacher's lounge and goes into the stairwell on the third floor landing. And if we could pause here. On this third floor landing, the uh, suspect leaves his rifle uh, as well as other equipment that he had brought with him during this incident. He then flees down the stairs and out of the building. Uh, 
you can continue, please. Uh, at that point, we track his movement. He uh, uh, flees the campus in a uh, southwest direction, eventually um, getting in with groups of students that are leaving the campus in response to the alarms. So we'll now hear for, from uh, Colonel Dale. Uh, you have a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, and we'll ask him to begin. Colonel? Hello, my name is Colonel Jack Dale. I'm with the Broward Sheriff's Office. I'm in charge of both professional standards and the Department of Investigations. The, uh, the, as our agency has continued to investigate this, we, we have a strong desire to learn from the tragedy, and uh, we welcome uh, all the input of the, the eventual report. And in doing so, you know, we, our intention is to operate in complete transparency and give you everything that we possibly can to help you make an informed decision. The, uh, we still have an ongoing criminal investigative effort. Uh, a number of statements still have to be taken. So these will be the best facts as we know them now. Um, they may or could be subject to change. We do have times that are listed. Those times are based on the, the clock that is a uh, part of the source of information. So not necessarily uh, one clock will be synced with another clock. So there could be off by uh, seconds in each of these uh, different sources. The uh, the investigative effort, uh, as the sheriff alluded to earlier, has been massive. Uh, following the events of uh, February 14th, in the following days, uh, we had to process a three-story building and uh, interview and, and make contact with literally thousands of witnesses, meaning uh, virtually every student in the school to determine who the witnesses were. The, uh, we received a, a high level of cooperation from the FBI, uh, Coral Springs Police Department, and surrounding agencies that uh, responded to the event. The, uh, as we uh, continue in the criminal investigation, there is also an ongoing effort to, for us to try and analyze and see what we can learn immediately. And uh, that's how we uh, compile some of the information that we're sharing today. We, uh, in addition to the House Committee, we also have a, a governor's investigation with FDLE, which we are cooperating with. Uh, the county has uh, contracted a consultant, so uh, I'm a part of that task force. We've also uh, enlisted the Police Executive Forum to do a lesson learned that will occur after these uh, two reviews. FBI Behavioral Science Unit has reached out to us in an event to also analyze the event. And uh, we certainly, after we uh, compile all the findings, will be giving presentations to other law enforcement agencies so they too can learn from this incident. I'd like to start by, uh, for those not familiar with Stoneman Douglas, is, is to kind of give some area facts and, and set the stage here. It's located in the city of Parkland. The population is approximately 37,000. Uh, staffing for Parkland on a typical day is a sergeant and four deputies, plus the, uh, any detectives or supervisor on scene or other school resource officers uh, throughout the town. It's attended by approximately 3,200 students, 200 staff. It's a 45-acre campus with 13 buildings. There's one full-time school resource deputy, and uh, district deputies typically assist with traffic details at both the opening uh, of school in the morning and uh, during dismissal. School has several unarmed security specialists on campus, and the video system within the school uh, covers 70 different camera angles. A vast majority of the camera angles are of exterior views that point internal to the classroom areas, Nearly all the classrooms are accessed from an outside door, uh, with the exception of Building 12. Building 12 is where the shooting happened. You'll hear it referred to as the 1200 building and the freshman building. It's a three-story building with uh, stairwells on the east and west. The suspect, uh, 19 years of age, was charged with 17 counts of homicide and 17 counts of attempted homicide. He's a former MSD student. He's been medically evaluated several times by school and Henderson Behavioral Health personnel. In each of those situations, uh, the criteria for an involuntary 
psychological evaluation, meaning in Florida, Baker Act, was, uh, was not met, and uh, he, was, he received no uh, involuntary incarceration, det detained in evaluation. He has uh, no prior arrest. Um, he received counseling from the school. That sc school counseling was discontinued once he reached the age of 18. Uh, apparently, once you become an adult, you are able to decline those services. He has uh, no juvenile civil citations that were issued through any law enforcement entity that we found. Um, the school board reports that there was no promise program participation. Uh, we have documents that we will be sharing, but uh, we're, we have, to, our, to our knowledge at this point, we, we do not know of any promise program participation. All of his weapons were purchased legally. He was armed with an AR-15 and more than 300 rounds of ammunition. His prior law enforcement contact. Uh, there are 49 BSO calls for service, either involving Nicholas Cruz or his address. Uh, when we look at those calls for service closer, we find that 18 of them directly involve Nicholas Cruz. Uh, a large number of the other uh, cases involve maybe his brother uh, or another issue that the mother has called for law enforcement services. Of the 18, they range for a variety of instances, uh, some as benign as uh, Cruz being stopped for riding his bicycle at night without a, a light on it, um, to uh, family disturbances where the mother is called, she's having difficulty uh, parenting her child. Uh, in one case, uh, she took away his Xbox and uh, he wasn't listening and locked himself in a room. Uh, there are no prior calls that would constitute a prosecutable criminal offense. There were no situations where a deputy would have had the ability uh, or probable cause to make an arrest. Two of the prior calls are being investigated internally, so they're an internal affairs investigation, and to the public, those facts uh, are not um, able to be disclosed. They deal primarily with uh, the efforts to document two of those prior calls and to determine whether the deputies in those instances documented uh, what they were, what was reported to them properly. There were also BSO tip, or FBI tips and uh, Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office calls for service that uh, we're receiving those, the information from those as well. In Parkland, the police and fire services are split. Parkland contracts the Broward Sheriff's Office to provide its law enforcement services, and Coral Springs Depart Fire Department is contracted for its fire EMS services. BSO has approximately 5,600 employees in the Department of Law Enforcement, we refer to as DLE. There are approximately 1,500 deputies over 16 districts to include the airport, seaport, and courthouse. In Department of Detention, we have approximately 1,300 deputies, three facilities, and in fire, 700 firefighter paramedics. We have a regional communications, 450 personnel. It's countywide for the past four years, and with two municipal uh, agencies that have opted out and continue to run their own uh, communication centers, and that would be Coral Springs and Plantation. We also have Children Protective Investigative Services contracted us to, by the state of 150 personnel and we run the county's crime lab, service all the county agencies for all its uh, laboratory services. I have a little slide problem here. The, in a typical 911 routing, what's missing from the photo, is uh, uh, the typical call comes in by either a landline or a cellular phone. It goes to 911, in the center of the slide, they're met by a call taker. The call taker interviews the, the caller, passes the information on to a dispatcher who either puts it out to the law enforcement side of the house or the fire side of the house, or both, if it calls for both. In Parkland, uh, it's a little different. We have a very unique situation where the law enforcement, well, while it's not unique to have separate agencies providing law enforcement and fire services, what is unique is that there are two different uh, communication centers used. And the way uh, that it's split up for Parkland, uh, a decision made some time ago, to have uh, landline 
911 calls go to the regional communication center, which would be BSO, and all cellular communications go to the Coral Springs Communication Center. So approximately 80 percent of the calls that a 911 center receives today come in by cellular callers. So in this case, what happens is if it comes in by landline, you look at the top of the flow chart, it comes into 911, the call taker filters the call. If it's fire EMS on the BSO side, so if it comes in landline, it goes to the call taker. If it's a fire EMS call, it gets transferred over to Coral Springs. If Coral Springs takes a cellular call, that should be a police call, it gets transferred over to BSO. So that way, it's an extra step, but it will occur in order to make sure that the proper entity receives that call and can respond. So during the event from 2.22 p.m. to 3.35 p.m., we just used those times surrounding the event, 911 landline calls are routed to BSO. BSO receives approximately 71 incoming calls during this time. No calls were abandoned, that meaning that they were all answered. Every call that came in was picked up by an operator and there was contact made. It could mean that if a call was abandoned, it could mean the person, either the call was dropped, it rang for a certain amount of time, and they hung up. We have a large number of trunks being a regional system, and there were no calls that received a busy signal. There was only one inbound call that was received from the school. All the other calls were either second or third hand callers, meaning that maybe a parent had received the text of the shooting at the school, and they were calling because they were concerned about what was happening at Stoneman Douglas, but they had little, if any, direct information regarding what was happening at the school that would be considered real time. The remaining 70 calls, it said all second and third hand. The one that was inbound was a voice over internet. It was a male whispering, and then he disconnected. On the Coral Springs side, they received the cell phones. They're routed to their system. They received approximately 86 calls. This is an estimate from the data they provided to us. Callers abandoned 21 of these calls, meaning that they simply rang or were disconnected before they could be answered, and a busy signal was received, according to AT&T, by one of these calls at 2.27 p.m., meaning that their trunks had filled and it had reached the capacity of their system. The three calls of the 86 were transferred or relayed from Coral Springs to BSO. In the initial calls, the actual caller themselves was not transferred. It was simply what information was learned by the call taker, and it was shared with the Broward call taker. And the information can best be summarized in the four bullet points. First was the initial call of shots fired at Stoneman Douglas, that they could hear, actually hear shots fired over the callers. Someone was shot in the 1200 building, then a shooter in the North Student parking lot, and later on, much later into the event, third-hand information that the shooter was wearing a vest. That was what was gleaned, essentially, from the calls that came into Coral Springs. The campus map is displayed here. You can see outlined is the Stoneman Douglas campus, and to the west, West Glades Middle School. The football fields will come up, as well as Building 12, which is highlighted in red. I'll now walk you through an incident timeline to put some of that in perspective with the things that are happening outside the building. You'll see there are two columns. The column on the left is the information that is provided to deputies that are out on the scene and through their transmissions. The items on the right, if they're from another source, they're in white, to give you some time reference. If they're in blue, they're on a separate channel for Coral Springs Police. In the case of the two communication systems, the Coral Springs radio channels are inaccessible to Broward Sheriff's Office, and we're advised that they were unable to dial into our channel, which you'll refer to as 8-Alpha. 
the, uh, the, and normally in a, uh, a regional system, we would just simply patch the two channels so that everyone would come together and they would be sharing common information. However, for the duration of the incident, uh, the response from Coral Springs and, and BSO have, uh, must operate on two different channels. And uh, attempts to patch are unsuccessful. There is a request for Coral Springs to come onto a joint channel so that joint channel can be patched, but for whatever reason, it, it, it never happened. It was not successful. So what we do is we separate the two timelines so you can see what the information is of the, uh, the first responders in Parkland. So at 219 is the uh, time at which the Uber drops off the suspect at the school. And at 221 is when he enters the uh, building 12 through the east entrance and uh, makes his we weapon ready. It's at, then at 221 that the school resource officer, Peterson, receives a call of possible firecrackers at building 12. Also at 221, uh, the suspect begins shooting uh, on the first floor. At 222 is when the 911 calls uh, begin to come into Coral Springs via cell phones at the school and the uh, fire alarm is then activated. And of course, during the fire alarm, the students, it's the second fire alarm of the day. There was another one at around 10 o'clock, um, but the students begin to exit the classrooms. Suspect proceeds to the, uh, at this point, the first floor shooting has already occurred. The, uh, he proceeds to the second floor, and uh, we have uh, the school resource officer coming on to scene and he is located on the east side of the building. He reports shots fired, and those shots fired appear to be uh, timed with the last shots fired on the first floor when you see one of the victims opens the exterior door and uh, in the stairwell. So we believe that those, uh, the opening of the door allowed those rounds to project outward and make it clearly audible to those outside the building. Peterson arrives, and uh, at the same time that he begins to transmit, there's the alert tone uh, coming over the radio to let the units know of the active shooter uh, based on the information received from Coral Springs. Um, Peterson hears the alert tone and then immediately comes over and announces that there are possible firecrackers, possible shots fired uh, at the 1200 building at MSD. He says, you know, quote, uh, we're looking at the 1200 building at 225. The suspect is uh, on the second floor and then uh, proceeds fairly rapidly through the second floor. There are no victims there. We believe that uh, of all the students that are there, they're sheltered in place. It, it appears that they can possibly hear the rounds on the, the floor below. The third floor uh, it seems that there's enough of a buffer that they're responding to the fire drill. Suspect proceeds to the third floor at 224, and at 225, a Coral Springs officer comes on their channel, on a talk round channel, and asks if there's a uh, possible active shooter at Stone and Douglas. It appears that he's run across a fire crew, and the fire crew is responding. They've exchanged this information, and the Coral Springs officers first learn from this uh, sort of random exchange that, uh, that it's occurring. Uh, the dispatcher confirms it. He then repeats it on the main sh their main channel, and uh, that's when the response from Coral Springs begins. At 2.25, uh, deputy reports that hear shots fired, shots fired by the football field. Peterson says, uh, okay, we're also looking at the 1200 building, and uh, there are deputies to the west that uh, believe that the shots are coming from the football field area. At 2.26 on the uh, Coral Springs channel, they uh, are told of the, the shooting there on their main channel and uh, that they can hear shots being fired through the phone and that they think their landline was a teacher. The, at 2.26, they advise of the active shooter and that the, the line, their lines are quote unquote blowing up. At 2.26 on the BSO side, uh, they hear shots fired, shots fired. Um, unable to determine a, uh, a, a place of uh, origin. At 227, 
deputies report more shots fired by the football field and at two twenty seven the suspect is now discarded the weapon the flees from the building also at two twenty seven uh... peterson comes on the air and says make sure no one comes in front of the school on the coral springs side the first uh... coral springs officer arrives on scene it's officer burton in the arm of the rifle comes onto the south side of the campus and proceeds uh... walks from the south toward the twelve hundred building he's met by a uh... security personnel and receives a uh... description of the suspect that he puts out on the radio that description goes out at 228 on their channel only. At 227, um, Peterson is make sure no one comes close to the front of the school. At 228, tells units to stay 500 feet from the 1200 building. Um, also at 228, a deputy advised that he has a gunshot victim located on the west end of the football field. Also at 228, there's a gunshot victim near the entrance of Westglade. Uh, on the BSO side at this point, the, uh, the only victims that are known are at the football field, and we have shots fired at the football field in the area of the 1200 building. So the information at this point is uh, there are no indications to deputies that there are victims that are within the 1200 building. At 229, deputies advise they do not know where the shooter is, and they attempt entry into building 13. Also at 229, over the Coral Springs channel, they advise of three victims down in room 1216. This is the first transmission uh, over a, a channel to law enforcement where there's actually a pinpointed location within 1200. Um, when you, there are further CAD records that show additional calls that are also coming out on the Coral Springs side related to victims uh, in the uh, 1200 building. At 2:30, Coral Springs officers moving with two BSO deputies. Uh, advise that they see a victim down outside the 1200 building. They do not know where the suspect location is at that point. At 2.30, the captain asks if a perimeter has been set, if the kids are being cleared out of the school. Coral Springs requests on their channel traffic to be blocked. Uh, school lets out at 2.40. There's a large number of parents coming into the area at the same time, and there are students leaving the campus uh, from the, the fire alarm activity. At 2.31, uh, the first arriving Coral Springs officer is uh, on the east side of the 1200 building and becomes in contact with Peterson. At 2.32, BSO and the group make entry into building 12 through the west entrance and they begin to extricate victims. Also at 2.32, dispatch again advises the gunshot uh, victims in room 1216. On the Coral Springs side, they have also reports uh, gunshots going in or out of a third floor window, uh, and there are bolt holes in that uh, west side window. At 2.33, a BSO team advises they make entry into Building 9. At 2.34, the captain establishes a command post. At 2.35, uh, the first victim is taken by golf cart uh, out to EMS by Coral Springs and BSO. And at 2.35 on the Coral Springs channel, they advise there are uh, plenty of officers in the 1200 building starting to move up floors. We do not have an active scene, is what they report. Meanwhile, there are attempts uh, by deputies and officers to pair up with security personnel and to start. Uh, they're basically standing together with their radios out trying to relay information to one another. And uh, shortly thereafter, we start to see the first effects of radio failure, uh, what we call throttling or fail-safe mode. At 2.36, additional C, uh, Coral Springs and BSO personnel enter 12, Building 12. At 2.40, K-9 uh, is on scene as part of an apprehension effort. At 2.40, officers begin clearing the second floor of Building 12. At 2.41, Deputies report having radio transmission problems. Uh, when, we, when we term throttling or fail safe, these happen when a certain number of users uh, basically overload the system, meaning that so many people turn on that the system starts to uh, have a failure. The, we've experienced the same thing in the Fort Lauderdale airport shooting, and uh, 
the radio system the current radio system is end of life and the county we're told has they maintain the infrastructure and that they plan to replace the system in two thousand nineteen the results are that people are attempting to transmit and they can't gain the channel and they can't put information over and it's witnessed by body camera footage where we see deputies paired up with officers and security personnel attempting to relay information over their independent channels and they're attempting to key up and it's taking them four or five attempts at transmission before they can get across a single piece of information at two forty four the first bolo comes out over a BSO channel for the suspect with his description at two forty four um, Coral Springs advises that they have a patch, but it's uh, unsuccessful. At 244, the Coral Springs requests the perimeter as they have they're being flooded by parents. At 247, the patch is abandoned um, and the throttling becomes more pronounced on the radio. Again, as more people dial into the channel, it uh, exceeds the capabilities of the system. At 250, the suspect enters the Walmart. 252, he leaves the Walmart, and at 251, BSO SWAT enters uh, Building 12. They were in training at Markham Park in Weston and uh, responded directly up from Weston to the scene. At 302, officers and deputies began clearing the third floor. At the same time, the suspect leaves the McDonald's. At 302, B dispatch advises uh, of the suspect leaving westbound from the school. It's later determined that this is a approximately 20 minute delay. It seems that uh, security personnel attempting to identify who they believe the shooter is have rewound the footage. They can't see him on live footage so they've gone back in time and uh, they're putting out a description of him but unbeknownst to the uh, officers and deputies that this is actually a delayed image that they're looking at. At 3.05, um, Coral Springs advised on their channel that the suspect ran west and south from the school. At 3.09, um, the identity is learned on the BSO side and they have put out his, uh, his name. At 3.13, you see four minutes later, um, the Coral Springs channel puts out the identity of the suspect. At 3.16, uh, Colonel assumes command of the incident and uh, he reports also the difficult in uh, transmitting due to radio problems. There are several times where the, uh, the prior on-scene commander, Captain um, Jordan, is actually attempting to transmit on her radio. It's not working. She tries using someone else's radio. It's not working. She tried a car radio, and that wasn't working. So um, there are times in the tape where they're calling her, and she's attempting to transmit, but can't reply. At 325, BSO detective relays a possible address for the suspect. We have detectives. Uh, attempted to locate his home. We're speaking with the Cruz family and we learned that he's at possibly in the area of the McDonald's. By 3.33, officers and deputies continue to evacuate students and teachers in the other buildings. At 3.39, a suspect's detained and at 3.40, he's confirmed to be in custody. That's all the information that I have.